If you say, I want work-life harmony, okay, well, what do you mean? I guarantee you my version of work-life harmony looks different than yours, but I really believe we all need a creative spark or something that gets us going. For some of you, it could be your children. I talk a lot about children in my book as great examples, especially of getting curious, right? If you look at how a child looks at the world and how they discover things or things are new, especially for people who struggle with recreation, watch children play. Watch the wonder, excitement, all the things that show up when kids are just in it, right? If they're dancing, they don't care how they look dancing. They're not self-conscious, right? I think as adults, we complicate so many things and we're like, well, if I'm going to just like spend time dancing, then I want to take like the perfect class and then I need to get the perfect dancing class outfit. And by the time we're stressed out and it's like not recreation at all. Well, hello there and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. So let me ask you a question. Could you use a little bit more work, life, harmony? Anybody? Do you ever struggle with work, life, harmony? Well, then this episode with Tina Wells is for you. She is the author of 20 books, but her latest book called The Elevation Approach, Harness the Power of Work-Life Harmony to Unlock Your Creativity, Cultivate Joy, and Reach Your Biggest Goals. That is what we talked about on this interview, and I found it so fascinating. One of the biggest things this book is about is how, basically how to create the life that you want, but it's also how to come back from burnout, how to not get burned out. What does that actually look like to live a life where you have harmony in what it is that you're doing? With Tina, she's someone who at 16, she started her first company. She's written 20 books. She's written, you know, youth fiction. And there's so much that this woman has done in her relatively short time on earth. I was just so impressed with what she talked about and how much of it resonated with me. And, and I think with you guys as well, where it's so hard to prioritize our own play, our own rest, like what we need to fill up our own bucket. And she has so many amazing ideas for you in this interview. So I really hope that you enjoy this interview with Tina Wells as much as I enjoyed interviewing her. Wow. I'm so excited to welcome Tina Wells to the Terry Cole Show. Welcome, Tina. Terry, I am so, so thrilled to be here with you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Tina, there's just so many things that I'd literally, I've been sitting here laboring over where to start. Of course, we're going to get to your newest book that just came out, The Elevation Approach, Harness the Power of Work, Life, Harmony to Unlock Your Creativity, Cultivate Joy, and Reach Your Biggest Goals. Okay, so we're definitely going to get to that. But I must start with, your story is so fascinating to me because you started so young. So can we just talk a little, would you share a little bit with our listeners and our viewers, your backstory of like, I think 16, is that when you started? Yeah, I was 16 years old. I like to call myself an accidental entrepreneur. I literally did not plan to start a business at 16. I didn't know what I was doing. I fell in love with writing and pop culture. And at the time, my dream was to be a fashion editor. I did what I guess most 15 year olds would do. And I was reading Seventeen Magazine, answered an ad to write for a newspaper for girls. And that kickstarted a career really in trend spotting, which led to starting my agency, which led to 20 plus years as a marketer. Wow. It's so amazing though, that, that you had that. What do you think it was for you that that ambition at such a young age? Because a lot of kids at 15, 16, 17, we're just getting into trouble. Like we're, we're not being ambitious. I was just getting into trouble at that age. So where do, where do you think that came from for you? It, it's funny, Terry. I don't even think for me at the time I could identify it as ambition. I think it was curiosity. Mm. And I think I'm still a curious person. Like I'm generally like, I'm curious about so many things. And at the, that time, like how products get made is something that has always fascinated me my entire career. And it's literally what I do now. I make products for other people. And so um, it's so funny to have that full circle moment in a way. But I have throughout my career always been focused on consumers, products that are sold to them. 
And I've been at some part of the process for many, many years on the marketing side, now on the product development, the merchandising, creation, execution side, and and still doing the creative stuff I love to do with writing. And so I definitely identify with ambition now. I think in my 40s, I, I, I identify very strongly with that language. But I think at that time, I was just a curious kid doing things. And I, and I say that especially for your listeners and viewers, because if your kids are curious, my parents were so, I was so lucky to have them embrace my curiosity Mm. and not say, you should focus on this, you should focus on that. We just figured it out, right? They said, school's your responsibility. You have to keep up with that, but let's find a way to, to really cultivate your curiosity. It's kind of amazing the difference that it makes when you have parents who support your dreams. And there's a certain level of Mm. respect that you're talking about where instead of relating to you as like, well, you don't know, there was a part of them was like, they must've thought you knew something or they wouldn't have supported it. Definitely. And I think, um, you know, I'm the oldest of six. So I think growing up with so Mm. many siblings and we're all very different, we all very different careers and seeing how my parents took time to allow each of us to cultivate our interest. Um, you know, it was just the home we grew up in, which was, you know, you have responsibility, you have accountability, but sure, you like something, you know, go do it. My mom, I remember when I became a teenager, she got me a subscription to Teen Magazine. <laughs> and she was like, you should just have this. And I remember every month, right? Like the joy, if you're a 90s teenager like me, right? The joy of getting our monthly magazines and just for me, looking at product, looking at trends. And so it's always been something that's been really motivating and exciting for me. It, it's interesting. And how I want to know how this sort of, because listen, we're all multifaceted. You are clearly multifaceted, mm-hmm. but you've written over, I don't know, 20 books. I mean, how many books have you written 20, in your life? Yeah. 20 wow. books now. That's a lot of writing. So <laughs> how did you get started on that process? As you will find, the answer to a lot of the big questions are accidentally. (laughs) That's the answer. Um, So I was maybe at this time 10 years into the agency, and I had a publisher as a client. And this was the time when marketing companies, youth marketing companies, were actually creating book concepts. So your viewers and listeners might not know, like concepts like Sisterhood of the Traveling Plants, Gossip Girl were Mm -hmm. books created by marketing companies that then became these huge franchises. And so I was invited to do the same thing. And my initial response was, no, I'm too busy running my company. I don't have time. And then I ended up doing some work for very large consumer products company in helping them understand a new customer emerging called a tween. And obviously we all know Mm -hmm. who tweens are now, but like (laughs) back in the the day... (laughs) In 2006, it was a very new concept. And during that course, I I met a mom and she asked me during a focus group break, what do I do? My daughter's 10 and she's reading Gossip Girl. And she said, I love Mm -hmm. that she's reading, maybe not the most age appropriate. And that was one of those aha moments for me when I thought, could I develop something good, but yet it is fun and edgy and as engaging as like, say, Gossip Girl for a tween? And that's mm-hmm. what really started my tween books and started, you know, Mackenzie Blue, which became Z Files, Honest June, The Stitch Click. And so I love to write about girls in that tween life stage. And I love to write about, you know, adventures girls have. It's so interesting, though, how it, it all sort of came out of what you were already doing and yeah. all, all in the same sort of vein. So, so you've been focused on this for sort of all of that time. And now moving into, because you've had all of this success for this mm-hmm. long period of time, and you've had all of these opportunities that you've created for yourself to do all this great stuff. Let's talk a little bit about burnout. Yeah. So the first time it showed up for me, I was 27 years old. And this was about 11 years into my company. Things were going well. By this point, I think around 25, I had a cover story with O Magazine you know what that meant for a career back in 2005, you know? So all the the things were happening and I was not happening. I was Mm -hmm. really for the first time experiencing burnout. And, you know, my cousin who's one of my best friends said, let's go on a vacation and, you know, don't bring your laptop. And I remember feeling like I can't disconnect from my laptop. What would that even look like? 
and Mm -hmm. finally doing it and saying, okay, I can do this lay by the pool thing. Literally, that was a new concept for me to like lay out (laughs) and do nothing. And from there, what I realized was I then started using vacation almost like a Band-Aid and not really focusing it on the bigger problem, which for me was finding work-life harmony. And when I finally mm-hmm. got there, I what I figured out was I had really perfected these two phases, preparation and inspiration. And what was really missing for me was recreation. And then when I wanted to bring this whole process together, I realized recreation brought transformation, but I was having mm-hmm. a hard time really like bringing anything together. You know what I mean? Like that final piece of like, and it's done. I always was perpetually looping and iterating and reinventing and not like finishing anything, you know? And so I had to fix that for, and and I, I was feeling that I was feeling like, like I wasn't ever settled, but I also think at the time, again, if we time ourselves to what was happening in society, we were all being told to hustle hustle hard, hustle culture, hustle, hustle. So I just thought I was doing what everybody else was doing and I was successfully hustling, but it was not helping like me physically, mentally, spiritually at all. Yeah. There's something that is so resonant for me about what you're talking about with the burnout, because it was like, it was so held up as this way of being that Mm-hmm. that success and being exhausted and never, when you said you never took an actual vacation without, you know, being plugged in. I never, I never took a vacation without talking to people. Even when I had a private mm-hmm. therapy practice, I would literally do certain sessions while I was on vacation. And of course that does not, obviously I, I experienced my own burnout in life because you can't do that. But what I find really interesting And was that the motivation for the elevation approach? Was that experience? Not quite. I think the experience that most impacted the book was my father getting very ill Mm -hmm. a few years ago. And I, I spent a lot of time with him in the hospital and he had a profound happiness during a period I would consider not happy. And what I realized was, oh, dad's really happy with his life, right? He's happy with the family. He's happy with career, faith, all the things that matter. Mm -hmm. And how do I get there? Because I knew instantly I wasn't there. I wasn't in harmony. And I also knew then the path to getting where I wanted to go wasn't going to be so easy. And I was going to sacrifice a lot of things. And, you know, there, I, I don't think that all changes require enormous sacrifice. I just knew this one for me was going to require that because I needed to change so many things at once. Right. Right. But, but also when you think about it, Tina, when we're thinking to change something, what we know is what we've been doing. So I always say this therapeutically, like, I know it's scary to sort of give up the thing that you've been doing, even though this thing is making you friggin' miserable, because right now you're not positive as to like, what is on the other side Mm -hmm. of the giving up, right? It's like the devil we know. So I can understand Mm -hmm. the fear of changing, changing careers. For me, I went from being a talent agent to being a psychotherapist. And it was like, I knew all the things I was going to give up, which was like all the money in the world and all the prestige and all the famous clients and all of the bi-coastal life. But when I really got down to it, I was like, are you enjoying any of this stuff? Mm. And the answer was really no. I had been over it for a long time and I knew I had to give up the thing, the known (laughs) Mm. for the unknown. But I think that you hit a tipping point a lot of times where you're like, okay, I'm I'm ready. I'm going to take the risk because, wow, this really sucks. Like I I just got to be done doing this thing over here. So can we, can we talk a little bit about how to create work-life harmony, how you're teaching this to us in the book? And I just want to say that I love work-life harmony as opposed to work-life balance, which I sort of never I don't know why, but that did never resonated with me. And as soon as I read Work Life Harmony, I was like, oh, "That's what I want. That's what everybody <laughs> wants." So I love that change so. in the way that you presented it. I think that that concept really crystallized for me post pandemic, because I think we focused so much on the chaos and the things that were happening 
during the pandemic and maybe a lot of negative things, but not some positive things that happened, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about busy career parents who for the first time were home at lunchtime with Mm -hmm. their kids, they could have a meal together and then all go back and focus on work and meetings and you could have a sight line to your child and see them during the day that all that made us feel a certain kind of way. You know, like my family, we would organize Jackbox nights on Zoom where we would play games together. And it was such a fun, cool way to connect. And so I felt like we, we all didn't want to lose that, you know, and what that really looked like was things working together. When I think about work-life harmony, I often say to people, think about making your favorite meal by memory, right? You don't always know every ingredient that you put in, but you know when you put something in that's not right. Or if you're mm-hmm. writing a song or, you know, making music, you know when a chord is off, right? Mm-hmm. To me, that's the concept of work-life harmony. It's trusting yourself when to know when something is off and to say, this doesn't fit. And balance doesn't work because what happens when we're in a state where we're really busy with work? Then you just play more and work more and play more and work. And so you're never feeling aligned. You're just feeling overwhelmed by now both work and the need to to add play, right? Instead of feeling like, I got this, things are good. Harmony says, it's okay if you're on a Zoom and, you know, your child comes in and says, mom, I need, right? That would have never Mm -hmm. happened three or four years ago. We would have been like, so inappropriate. And now we chuckle and we move on with the meeting, you know? And so- I, I think we all feel harmony is what we want. Maybe we haven't had the language. You know, I certainly didn't invent the idea of work-life harmony, but I think bringing it together and talking more about how you have it is something that I feel is a little bit newer, right? Like we, we've heard the idea, but now I want us to go through a journey of what that feels like and how you create it for yourself because it is very much a personal thing that you have to do. You know, I feel like every person has to figure out what work-life harmony is for them how they want to experience it and like what their secret sauce is. Right. It, it's so true. It's so personal. And when you think about what I saw in my therapy practice and my masterminds and coaching from the pandemic is that the things that people avoided for a long time, because if you're seeing someone two hours a day, one hour a day, you can avoid problems in a marriage mm-hmm. by being so mm-hmm. busy and by not seeing the person often and you know sort of being in your separate lanes and then people were locked down together mm-hmm. and it was like every crack in the veneer of that relationship either people dealt with the cracks and mended them or those cracks just became chasms and and people split i mean there were so many i felt like with my clients who went one way or the other either people were like we're super digging the mm. lockdown experience. We're do- exactly yep. like you said, we're playing games, we're being creative, we're doing arts and crafts with the kids or with each other, we're hiking, we're, you know, there was mm-hmm. all of these ways that people got inspired and energized. And then there was the other of people yeah. being like, I can no longer deny what's happening. But either way, it sort of sets us up when we think about what your book is really all about. It sets us up for this, the elevation approach is like, it's like perfect timing to come out right now because we're, we've come out of that. A lot of the changes I've seen in my clients, their new normal is starting to begin now. Mm-hmm. So I just feel like your book is really coming at an opportune time to, as like sort of a GPS of, cause people also changing what their dreams are. Mm-hmm. So what is your, you, you've done a lot of this um, making manifest in the world, things that were an idea in your head that have become books and products and things that are, you can buy in Target, like actual things. So would you weigh in and tell us your thoughts on any of the steps to sort of making a dream a reality? I think for me, the most important step is that conversation with yourself to say, I want that. You know, do you really want it? And I also talk a lot in the book about like at any point in time, if this is no longer working for you, start again, pause, do something different. It is okay for our dreams and goals to change and to evolve as we change and we evolve. What I have wanted in my life has changed and evolved. You know, I think others might relate to like me being young and 
being good at something and that not necessarily being how I wanted to choose to show up, but I was good at it, right? So it was really scary to say, I'm going to go at this a different way. And also maybe a little guilt of like, who am I to abandon a really great career <laughs> and do something different? And then you start to ask yourself like, who am I to be entitled or feel entitled to what I want out of my life, right? And so the book definitely gives you a guide to work-life harmony, but then we also talk through the four phases of the elevation approach, right? Preparation, inspiration, recreation, and transformation. And I live this every day. I literally live it as my, my day. So I start my morning in preparation, afternoon, in inspiration. That's really when I get social, go out and see people, have meetings. Recreation is when I do take that pause. And transformation is when I try to bring the day together. You know, the elevation approach is also seasonal, right? So think of winter as preparation, spring as inspiration, summer as recreation, and fall as transformation. Mm -hmm. So what I really hope is that if you choose to use this tool, that you start to live it that way, to say, I can always choose again if I'm in a season that we don't really go against the season you're in, embrace right. it. I think if we learned anything from a pandemic is we all were forced to embrace something. None of us probably wanted to embrace in the beginning, you know, but mm -hmm. we were forced to. And whatever you choose for yourself, you've got to like embrace it. Don't go against it because then you're just making things harder. But you have to take some time to ask yourself what you really want. And, that, and I hope that the book becomes an invitation to do that. I, I love the idea, the four the four phases and how they can sort of be, they're overlaid on your day, but they're also overlaid on your calendar in like sort of a, a more macro way. So in preparation, it's ask the right questions, get curious about the possibilities, figure out what you have, what you need and what you can give. This is from the book. And I love that so much. That alone is a guiding principle of getting curious and asking the right questions is mm -hmm. so incredibly important. And what I, what I find happens is that if I can have this, I'm literally, I have it copied and I'm going to be putting it on my wall, that if we can bring it down to the basics of what you're sharing with us, we can do it. And that requires staying present and not getting caught up in the just get it done, right? Like I find that when I'm overwhelmed or when I'm, when I'm feeling burnt out, that everything becomes a box that I have to check. Even the things that like used to bring me joy, seeing my mother, seeing my sisters, being with my friends. I'm sort of like, I gotta drive to see my mother, just check the box, you know? <laughs> Which is definitely not the way I want to approach it and allowing there to be times when, you know, when you're when you're going through the uh fallow part, right? So winter is, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter where you live. There's, there's different seasons for different things that we're doing in our lives. But I have a question for you specifically about recreation, because I can tell you from the people who are in my crew, this is one of the hardest things to do. I mean, unless it's a group thing that we're planning for other people, unless it's like, unless we've got some function in there, Making room for rest and play. That I find is, pro I would say for my crew, that's probably one of their biggest challenges. So how do you, in your own life, how would you suggest if someone is such a type A workaholic, how are they making room for rest and play? You mean if they were me? <laughs> um, yes. I. <laughs> The advice, I, it's funny. I say this as a person who I definitely consider myself a type A workaholic. And what I realized when I started doing this was my work got better. And what I mean by that is I don't mean a workout, right? Like that is something mm -hmm. for me that's part of preparation that is like what I have to do to show up to do the thing. I mean like putting on your favorite podcast and taking a stroll and not at all thinking about the work at hand. And what I would find when I came back to my desk is I had an answer to a problem. I had a new way of looking at something. It made my work better. And so while it wasn't answering emails on a walk, what would we do if I were trying to be productive? I take a call on a walk, right? 
-hmm. And all I'm doing is working and working my like body. But then if you're like doing something fun and there's movement and flow, of course, when you get back to your desk, there's movement and flow because you've gotten yourself in that space, but it wasn't in a stressful, you know, sometimes we're on our calls, right? And we're stressed out or we're dealing mm -hmm. with something and that stress isn't getting relieved versus like listening to a podcast or listening to, I love fiction books and audible mm -hmm. and all the kind of, like I could watch 20 minutes of TV. I could watch the view, anything that's just a release. Mm -hmm. I promise you, if you try it once and you go back to work, and you see it's better, it will become a practice for you. But it's hard for a reason because we're all women who are products of hustle culture. Many of my readers I know are, I consider us like a sandwich generation, meaning we're sandwiched between caring for children and caring for aging parents. Yep. So the idea that we can rest and play at the busiest, mm -hmm. most vibrant parts of our life doesn't make a lot of sense to us. Like it just doesn't compute. But the benefits that you're talking about are so profound and the relief. It's like a lot of the, I'm, I'm interested now, I'm talking quite a bit about like allowing and surrendering mm -hmm. to certain things and like asking for help and letting other people help us, which for most of my, you know, over-functioning women is like, they're like, I got it. It's fine. I can do it better. It, it'll take too long for them to do it. And I remember my mother saying to me many years ago, I was complaining about some boyfriend who couldn't brown garlic and didn't know how to vacuum, I think. And she was like, Dara, if you, if you need everything to be done your way, you'll end up like me doing it all alone. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. like, damn, I do not want to <laughs> end up there. She was like, your father never picked up a vacuum, babe. If your boyfriend is vacuuming, just shut up and let him like, it doesn't need to be perfect, but there was something about that realization that even the, the need for control was so deep in that moment and it's so constricting. So I love the idea of just creating moments of space, as you're saying, throughout the day where you can come back and be more creative. In the inspiration phase, you talk about collecting creative sparks. And do you mean from other people or you mean from yourself? I, again, I think it, that is what it means to you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so much of the book is sitting with yourself and asking yourself questions. It's almost a getting to know you again process, because if you say, I want work-life harmony, okay, well, what do you mean? What does that mean? I, I guarantee you my version of work-life harmony looks different than yours, but I really believe we all need a creative spark or something that gets us going. For some of you, it could be your children, right? Watching mm -hmm. them. I talk a lot about children in my book as great examples, especially of getting curious, right? If you look at how a child looks at the world and how they discover things or things are new, um, especially for people who struggle with recreation, watch children play. Watch mm -hmm. the wonder, excitement, pleasure, all the things that show up when kids are just in it, right? If they're dancing, they don't care how they look dancing. They're not mm -hmm. self-conscious, right? I think as adults, we complicate so many things and we're like, well, if I'm going to just like spend time dancing, then I want to take like the perfect class and then I need to get the perfect dancing class outfit. And by the time we're stressed out and it's like not recreation at all, right? <laughs> or the girl's trip where you're like 450 missed text messages about planning the trip, you know, what we loved about the pandemic again in a way was like, oh, randomly everybody's home. Who wants to go on a walk at X in 20 minutes and let's just distance and walk, right? Like there were things yep. that happened that just felt just the idea that we could do something that made us feel human and alive, right? We couldn't organize our favorite workout in that way anymore. And so, right. you know, I think that's what the book is inviting you to do in a way is say, let's go back to basics. Let's really get to know ourselves again. Let's figure out in this new person, because I do believe post-pandemic, we're all new people, right? We've all discovered mm -hmm. a few new things about ourselves, how we want to live, who we want to live with, mm -hmm. what we want those situations to look like, who we want to work with. And yep. now you have to take all of that new information and put it into something and say, and this is how I want my life to look after all right. of this newness, you know? 
Right. All right. So you guys who are listening, the author is Tina Wells. The book is The The Elevation Approach, Harness the Power of Work-Life Harmony to Unlock Your Creativity, Cultivate Joy, and Reach Your Biggest Goals. I have another question for you, Tina, but I just wanted to make sure people know this book is available everywhere that fine books are sold. And Tina, tell us where we can find you, and then I'm going to ask you my final question. Uh, You can find me at tinawells.com. And on all the socials? (laughs) All the socials, primarily Instagram, Tina Wells as well. (laughs) Same. Um, Okay. So here's my question. I always ask people this question about boundaries because I'm obsessed with them. (laughs) For you personally, what has been your most challenging boundary struggle and how did you overcome it if you indeed have? Oh, that's a great question. Um, For me personally, it was my calendar. I got really behind the idea of doing less and consolidating things. And what I realized is when I had like a team around me who was really managing the calendar, we weren't always aligned. And so it's the one thing I do on my own. You know, I have amazing people who support me and support teams in many other areas. My calendar is no longer one of them that I'm willing Mm -hmm. to give up. So calendar and and travel. There are certain ways I want to travel. Times, I don't like flights and seats and things imposed on me. I know it sounds, but I have to travel a lot, right? So I think it's like I had to get control over the one thing that would dictate how I show up. And so imagine you're like flying and I'm I'm sometimes getting on 6 a.m. flights. That means I'm up at 3 a.m. I have to make as much of that a good experience to show up for who I'm showing up for. And when I realized I could do that and manage it and, and calendaring is like, a thing for me, right? It's like Mm -hmm. batch your errands, all the things we can do and do more efficiently and effectively. I realized I had, I had to maintain that. And so, um, I don't always get it right, but what I'm able to do is look at my calendar and ask myself, am I showing up? What's missing? And I, and I immediately can get to an answer because I'm in control of that. I love that so much. And I so resonate with it. Like, no, to having someone else book my travel because it's always going to be the wrong seat in the wrong time. And no, I don't want to. I don't want a three hour stop over in Philly. I really don't. At all. (laughs) (laughs) Like literally ever. (laughs) Tina Wells, it was my pleasure to have you on the show. You guys, again, the book is The Elevation Approach. It is available everywhere fine books are sold. Go get you one. Thanks again, Tina. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks, Terry. It was great.